We encourage you to take out your Bible as we continue our study of Esther. Turn over to Esther chapter 7 as we talk about a punishment executed by the providence of God. It's exciting times here at our church as we uh, think about, uh, we have seven people that are wanting to be baptized. Five are going to be baptized next week, and three of those will become members the first week of November. And, uh, and then later on, November, December, we're going to have another baptism for the other couple people as well. So pastoral search team is fast at work. So these are exciting times to be praising God and be praying for all that's going on here. Esther chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. So the king and Haman went in to feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king again said to Esther, What is your wish, King Esther, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you, and what is your request? Even to half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. For we've been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we have been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, Who is he, and where is he, and who has dared to do this? And Esther said, A foe, an enemy, this wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. And may God add his blessing at the reading of his word this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you today on this beautiful Sunday morning. We thank you for your wonderful creation outside as we see leaves changing and the seasons are changing. We thank you, Lord, that uh, your word does never change, Lord. It's always eternal. It's always true. It doesn't return void to us, Lord. And we just pray that you'll help us to have open hearts, to let your Holy Spirit speak to us in whatever manner you have for our hearts and lives today as we open the word. And Lord, just to speak through me, may it not be my opinion or my thoughts, but your thoughts as we look at your message today. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when I was a kid, I'm dating myself now, I used to get up on Sunday morning, or Saturday morning with my sister and we'd watch Wile E. Coyote while my parents were still asleep and The Roadrunner. How many of you ever watched Wile E. Coyote and Roadrunner? Yes. And it's interesting, poor Wile E. Coyote and so many morning cartoons I witnessed his incessant and insane attempt to try to capture or kill uh, the Roadrunner. He, however, was na- never able to do that. Unbeknownst to him, Wiley would never be allowed to achieve his, achieve his aim because the cartoon writer, Chuck Jones, had a list of nine rules to be applied to every episode of the Roadrunner. One of those was this. The Roadrunner cannot harm the coyote except by going beep, beep. And how many of us as kids would annoy our parents throughout the rest of the day Saturday, occasionally saying beep, beep, thinking of the Roadrunner, right? Number two, um, no outside force can harm the coyote, only his own ineptitude or the failure of the Acme products, right? The Acme products that would blow up on him. Number three, the coyote can stop any time if he were not a fanatic. And number four, the coyote is always more humiliated than harmed by his failures. That's four of the nine rules that the writer had for Wiley Coyote. Well, I find the similarities between Wiley Coyote and Haman amazing. Since Mordecai only refused to bow to him, he posed no physical threat to Haman. But to Haman, Mordecai's refusal to honor him was like the roadrunner's piercing beep beep in Wiley E's ears. Another similarity is that no one outside, no outside force caused Haman more harm than himself. We're given no evidence that God was forcing Haman to act in the ways he did. Though, of course, the possibility exists that God delivered Haman over to a corrupt mind, as we read about in Romans chapter 1, verse 28. But the author does not tell us this. Haman was not responsible, most responsible for his actions and their consequences. A third similarity is that neither Wiley Coyote nor Haman chose to stop pursuing what they lacked. Day after day, Haman chose the temptations of pride and anger, and ultimately to his own peril, which led us to one difference between the coyote and Haman. In the cartoon, Wally Cody was more humiliated than harmed, but in Haman's case, he was humiliated and then hanged. The trap Haman had constructed for Mordecai sprung on him, and apparently art and life really 
do imitate each other. Just as Wally Cody could never eliminate the roadrunner, God would never allow Haman or anyone else to destroy God's people. So let's look first of all on your outline. I encourage you to take out your outline and take notes, if you would. It's a good way to remember the points. You remember more that you write down than you just hear. We see, first of all, Esther's revelation and confrontation of sin. Esther's revelation and confrontation of sin. In her confrontation, she displays great courage. Great courage. Back to Esther 7. We just read these verses, but let me repeat them again, and then we'll dig into them a little deeper. So the king and Haman, in verse 1, said, went into a feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king again said to Esther, What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Even to half of the kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. Then Queen Esther answered, If I found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. The prophecy in the previous chapter, chapter 6, by Haman's wife and friends happened very quickly. They said bad things were going to come upon you because if Mordecai was a Jew and you're going after him, then things are going to happen that you're not going to like. And it came true in a very quick fashion. This displays God's reversal principle that so often characterizes God's retribution of the wicked in general and Israel's enemies in particular. In Galatians 6, 7, a verse we're familiar with, but it's something that we need to be reminded of continually. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows, that he will also reap. In Numbers 32, 23, a verse that I kind of keep in the back of my mind, it says, but if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord. And here's the key. Be sure your sin will find you out. It tells us in Hebrews 11 that sin is pleasurable for a season. But guess what? That season ends. And there's going to be a payday for the sin of our lives. Well, this is Esther's second banquet, but there are five banquets mentioned so far in the book of Esther. The king had two in chapter one. He had the government officials and then the people in Susa. And then concurrent to that, Queen Vashti had a a banquet going on as well. And then we see here Esther has two more. And Esther is offered a second time the opportunity to make a request and receive even up to half of the Persian kingdom as said to her by Ahasuerus. At this banquet, Esther gets right to the point when the king asks of her her request. In verse 3, notice what she says. She says there, if you would just grant me my wish. My wish is that you would save my life because she is revealing her ethnicity. She is saying that she is Jewish and she is pleading for her life. And then she goes on and pleads for the life of the Jewish people in the Persian Empire. We see in her communication, she displays a clever response. In her communication, she delivers and displays a clever response. Look at verses 4 through 6 of Esther 7. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed and to be killed and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, Who is he? And where is he who has dared to do this? And Esther said, A foe and an enemy, this wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. Notice how carefully and thoughtfully Esther responds to the king. This is the second time that she risks her life to ask permission for something. You remember, after she fasted three days and three nights, she didn't have permission to approach the king, but she did, and he welcomed her in. But he could have had her executed on the spot. So this is the second time, and she says that her and her people were sold to someone who could execute and exterminate the Jewish people and nation once and for all. She had four strategies. One, she talked about granting her wish. She was the wife of the king, and she was pleading for her life as a Jew, and she wanted to make sure she knew that even the king's wife could lose her life as a result of that decree. The second strategy, she uses the same words as were given in the edict that the king approved. 
destroyed, annihilated, killed. And then Esther shows her subservient attitude toward the king. She said if her and her people were just sold into servitude, into slavery, she would have kept silent. She wouldn't have said a word. But her fourth strategy, she did not bring up that Ahasuerus was as much to blame as Haman. This is different confrontation than Nathan, the prophet, when he went to David about the situation after he got involved in adultery with Bathsheba and it had her husband Uriah killed. Nathan was right up in his face. But the queen deferred from doing that. In Esther 3.9, we remember that they were sold out. Haman and Esther 3 9 said, If it please the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, the Jews. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business, that they may put it into the king's treasuries. That was half a year's taxes that he was offering to pay for if, they would, if he would decree to kill the Jews. In Esther 4 7, it says that Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Esther says her and her people's extinction was purchased by Haman, and Ahasuerus, in a sense, was the seller. One quote that we see here is that, quote, Esther's intricate plan was a necessary part of the process of bringing Haman to justice, a plan that required a combination of subtlety, a boldness and a strength to carry it through. One can be shrewd without being sinful, and Esther carefully walked that line. Ecclesiastes 3 7 says there's a time to keep silence and a time to speak. And this was the time Esther was all in and speaking the truth to sin and injustice. She showed tremendous courage. We remember in the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 1, when the transition was made. When Moses died and now Joshua was going to lead the two million Jews into the promised land, Joshua 1 has several times, be strong and courageous because Joshua was a fearful leader at the beginning. We read about Jesus and he talked about having courage. In Matthew chapter 9 verse 2, Jesus pardoned the sins of the paralytic before healing him and he said, have courage, take heart. Jesus said, have courage and take heart when he displayed his power when the woman touched the fringe of his garment and she was healed after it was revealed who it was. Jesus said, have courage and take heart at how he presented himself to the disciples on that night when he was walking on the water in Matthew 14, 27. Jesus appeared to the apostle Paul and said to him to take courage that Paul would not only testify about Jesus in Jerusalem, but also in Rome as God's plan and purpose for his life in Acts 23. One of the most publicized examples of courage involves a former USA Gymnastics team doctor, Larry Nassar. Rachel Denholder was the first to publicly make allegations against Larry Nassar. She and more than 150 other survivors of this abuse were given the opportunity to share impact statements in court. And Denholder... Hollander not only used the opportunity to pursue justice, but also to present the gospel to him. She courageously recounted to the court how she was 15, how Nasser sexually assaulted her under the guise of medical treatment for nearly a year, and how Larry Nasser is the most dangerous type of abuser, one who's capable of manipulating his victims through coldly calculated grooming methodologies presenting the most wholesome, caring external persona as a deliberate means to ensure a steady stream of children to continue to assault. With both conviction and compassion, Rachel would go on to speak these words directly to Larry Nasser in the courtroom. Quote, should you ever reach the point of truly facing what you have done, the guilt will be crushing. And that is what makes the gospel of Christ so sweet because it extends grace and hope and mercy where none should be found. And it will be there for you. I pray you experience the soul-crushing weight of guilt so you may someday experience true repentance and true forgiveness from God, which you need far more than forgiveness from me, though I extend that to you as well. 
Confrontation is never easy, especially when the one we're facing has harmed us or, as in Esther's case, threatens our harm. And I'm thankful that Den Holdender chose to pursue both Nasser's conviction but also his conversion to faith in Christ. No less courage was needed when Esther broke her silence about Haman. She had no idea what the outcome would be, but she was obedient to seize the opportunity. She could have been disposed like Queen Vashti, as we read about in chapter 1, or she could have even been executed on the spot. So here's the application. May we be like Queen Esther to courageously confront sinful injustice when we see it. May we be willing to stand up and speak. May we make an impact. May we do something about it, whatever that may be. But may we be like Esther to courageously confront sinful injustice when we see it. Let's turn our attention now to King Ahasuerus and his part of the drama in this chapter. So we're looking at the different people. We looked at Esther, now we're looking at Ahasuerus, and we'll look at Haman in just a moment. But Ahasuerus was surprised by the revelation and contemplated what to do with Haman. He meditated on it. He thought about it a little bit. <clears throat> First thing we find out about Haman is that he was easily swayed. He was easily swayed by Haman. We see, I'm sorry, King Ahasuerus was easily swayed by Haman. And we look at how Ahasuerus was easily counseled and persuaded by different people as we go through the book of Esther. The people and the government officials told him to depose Queen Vashti when she didn't show up when, he was, when she was asked to do that. And we see that in chapter 1 of Esther. He was told by his advisors to seek young virgins and find a new queen in Esther in chapter 2. The big one, he was bribed by Haman to help issue an edict to call for the annihilation of the Jews everywhere in the empire in chapter 3. And now we see once again in chapter 7, Ahasuerus makes a decision by being persuaded by Esther. He seems to be tossed around by the whim of those who currently have his attention. Thankfully, God provides spiritual leaders who are to disciple and equip the sheep in their flock so they stand firm and not waver on the gospel and not waver on what we believe. In Ephesians chapter 4, it says, God gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. And what's the purpose? To mature manhood, to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. We live in a time where there's more and more false teaching out there than I've ever experienced in my lifetime. With the, since after COVID, there's more and more people, for example, on YouTube and media places that you can go to and watch. And I've talked to people uh, that I've known that have gone straight away because they've found a teacher that sounded really good, sounded convincing, and they began to follow those things. And so we have to be careful that we're not tossed about by every wind of doctrine, but we know what we believe. That's one of the reasons that we're teaching a foundations class in one of our connect groups that meets over here every week to help us remember to not only know what the foundations of what we believe, but why we believe them and how they apply to our lives. So the way we avoid getting swayed by others who desire us to fall into sin and false teaching or anything that's contrary to God and his word is to stay strong in the teaching of God's word and our personal time in the word. That's why it's important to be here and be under the hearing of the word, but also spend that time daily studying for yourself. Well, Ahasuerus was shocked at Haman's betrayal. Ahasuerus, he was shocked at Haman's betrayal. Look at verse 7 of Esther 7. And the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went out into the palace garden. There's a lot of speculation as to why he went out into the garden in a rage. Some say it was to calm down so he could think about the punishment that was appropriate for Haman in regard to the situation. The king may have been thinking of a way to execute Haman legally, 
Although that doesn't seem to be possible because he was the king and whatever he said was law. Maybe the king was contemplating how to save Esther and her people after the decree had been made and now he was made aware that Esther was of Jewish ethnicity. Whatever the reason, Esther and Haman were left in the banquet hall with probably servants and military guard as Haman pleaded for his life. But then the king comes back in. In the end of verse 7, it says, he stated Haman's punishment. He stated Haman's punishment. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. And the king returned from the palace garden in the place where they were drinking wine as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. And the king said, will he even assault the queen in my presence, in my own house? Then Harbana, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king, said, moreover, the gallows that Haman had prepared for Mordecai, whose words saved the king, is standing at Haman's house, 50 cubits high. And the king said, hang him on that. Our application here is that may we be like a Hashuerus and not be hasty in proclaiming correction. We need to take our time. When our kids misbehave and we get angry, we need to make sure we're not punishing out of anger. When we have adult children that do things that may hurt us or harm us, we need to stop and pray and think how we would respond to that situation. When someone at work offends us or does something to harm us. We need to not just react, but take a few moments and think before you act. And I believe that's partially what Ahasuerus was doing by enraged going out into the garden. Finally, let's look at what happens to Haman because of his pride and because of his anger. We see Haman's downfall and the facing of his consequences of pride. He was confronted with his sin. He was confronted with his sin. It says in Esther 7, 6, And Esther said, A foe, enemy, this wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. And the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden. It was courageous on Esther's part to call it Haman to his face. She said he was a foe and enemy of her people. It says in the second part of verse 6 that Haman was terrified at Esther's request and statement. It's not known whether uh, he knew that Esther was a Jew. He didn't maybe even know that, he didn't know for sure if Esther maybe was tied in or connected to Mordecai. But if he did, that may have been what brought the most terror to Haman's mind. You see, he tried to confess his sin to avoid consequences. He tried to confess his sin to avoid consequences. Look again at verse 7. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. And the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. And the king said, Will even assault the queen in my presence in my own house? Haman was begging for his life because he probably knew that the king had already made up his mind to go ahead and have him executed. Now, Haman fell on the couch. What's significant about that? Well, back in those times, the Greek and the Romans, the Persians, people would uh, sit on a couch and recline as they ate or as they drank at a meal. And so she's there, you know, reclining in that situation, and Haman is leaning on the couch pleading for his life. But notice at just the right moment, the king came back into the room. Notice what it says in verse 8. Will he even assault the queen in my presence, in my own house? He was pretty ticked off, as you can tell. And we see this quote here. It's possible to be certain all along that Haman would never ultimately triumph, not because we have confidence in the greater cunning of Esther, but because we have confidence in God's covenantal promise to Abraham and his seed that God made an unconditional commitment to Israel, that he would always keep a remnant alive and keep them going. And somebody eventually would be on the throne of David to rule and reign forever and ever. And of course, we know that as the Messiah, King Jesus, and that would occur. We see that Haman faced his consequences by being executed. 
In verse 8, as the word left the mouth of the king that covered Haman's face. Then Harbana, remember him back in chapter 1, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king said, Moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, is standing at Haman's house 50 cubits high for all to see. And the king said, Hang him on that. In verse 10, so they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. And then the wrath of the king was abated. In verse 8, the covering of Haman's face meant that he was about to be executed. One of the king's seven eunuchs, Harbana, shares that Haman had built gallows in order to execute Mordecai. It's possible that Haman was hated by so many people in Susa and other government officials Many may have been glad that Haman was being executed. Haman was impaled on the stake for all to see that were allowed to be built to execute Mordecai. Think about it. At one 24-hour period, Haman was feasting with the king and queen, bragging about his wealth and his sons and his power with his wife and friends and making plans to get rid of that one source of constant frustration in his life, Mordecai. Then without warning, he was honoring the one from whom he wanted honor, and his life was taking on the very device he hoped would kill Mordecai. What a turnaround. Haman had no idea when he was taken to the second feast that he would return home to be hanged. And while the tables had been turned, the Jews were left with a serious problem. Even though Haman was now dead, By Persian decree, there would still be a great slaughter of many innocent people because of the wicked actions of one dead man. So stay tuned for next week's message in the ongoing saga of how God will miraculously save the Jewish people in the Persian Empire. Here's our application for this point. May we not be like Haman who continued in his sin and faced extreme consequences. Remember, Your sin will find you out. What we sow, we will reap, according to Galatians 6, 7. Some concluding thoughts. What can we learn about God in this chapter, in Esther chapter 7? First of all, God God does not need any counselors, and he always does what is right. He doesn't need advice. He doesn't have a cabin of counselors. He does what he does, and he does what is right. Second of all, God always defeats his enemies. No one can stand up against God. Their arms are too short. Their weapons aren't strong enough. And thirdly, God's wrath has been satisfied in Christ's death on our behalf. Think about that last verse of the chapter. Think about it this way. It says, so they hanged Haman on the gallows that he prepared for Mordecai. Focus on these words. Then the wrath of the king abated. Just as King Ahasuerus' wrath was abated, in the Hebrew that means pacified, That means his anger subsided. So God's wrath was pacified and abated at the death of Jesus Christ on the cross on our behalf. You see, when Jesus demonstrated his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He became the perfect lamb of God that was led to the slaughter willingly to lay down his life as a sheep to pay the price for our sins. The perfect sacrifice the last sacrifice that was needed to pay for sin. And when Jesus said in John 19, 30, it is finished, that means it was paid in full. Our debt of sin was taken care of. Now that doesn't mean that everyone in this world will be saved and go to heaven. You see, we individually must appropriate that action on our behalf by trusting in Christ as Savior, admitting that we are sinners in need of a Savior, admitting that we need to repent or turn away from our sin and be filled with Christ's righteousness. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, I call this verse the great exchange. It says, for our sake, God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What a blessing that is to think about, that God sent all the sins of the world on his son, Jesus Christ, who didn't deserve it, but was willing to be that final sacrifice, that final lamb of God that was necessary to pay for sin. And in exchange, when we come and we admit our sin and we admit that we can't earn our way to heaven and that we humble ourselves before God, 
He saves us. He forgives us our sin, but then he gives us his righteousness in the form of the Holy Spirit that lives within us, that we carry about around with us each and every day. So as we think about that, John Bloom said this, on this side of the cross, we now know fully what David, King David, didn't. God put away our sin by placing them on himself only at the cross. When we hear, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die ever, end of quote. Here's our key thought. May we courageously confront public wrongdoing that violates scripture and affects many lives. May we courageously confront public wrongdoing that violates scripture and affects many lives. One way we could all do that is to go and vote. To go and vote and, and, and let our voice be heard and show that we're against abortion. We're against the push of possibility of infanticide in the near future. It's scary to think that way. We have the power to vote, to stand up for injustice against it. And so as we think about that, let me leave you with this quote. Every day is like a fresh blank sheet of paper given to us by God, and we can never tell what wonderful surprises he may choose to write upon it. So much can happen in just a few hours. Our lives may proceed at an ordinary pace with nothing of great importance appearing to happen. Then suddenly, without warning, dramatic and amazing events may crowd into the space of a single day on any particular day remarkable. With each day given to us, may we live for the Lord and like Esther, confront sin and call for justice that rather than being like Haman, continuing in sin and then get caught in the consequences of our sin. As we think about that, let's look at this next slide if we would. And let's say these things together. This is the application for this book. Everybody has a story. God is writing the story of your life and the last chapter of your life has not been written yet. Amen to that because God has a bright future for each and every one of us. Let's bow in prayer today. And maybe you're here today, maybe you say, you know what? If I were to stand before God today and he were to ask me why he should allow me to go into heaven, I'm not sure. Maybe there's somebody here that says, I'm not sure how I can answer that question, what I would need to say. The Bible teaches that we're all born with a sinful nature. And that separates us from a holy God. God is holy and perfect, and we are imperfect. And all the good things that we could ever do, coming to church, putting money in the offering plate, helping people, serving others, they're all good things, but they're not going to pay for the price of our sin. It says in Romans 6.23, For the wages of our sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. At the end of our life, we're going to have to make a payment for our sin. But thankfully, Jesus became the payment for our sin when he died on the cross, as we shared. And he, he took and all that upon himself to abate the wrath of God, to cause that anger to subside, and to give us the opportunity to have eternal life. And all you need to do is realize you're a sinner and realize that you need a Savior and that Jesus died for you that you ask him to forgive you, and that you're willing to turn away from your sin and ask him to come into your heart and be your savior. Maybe here today, I'm just gonna pray this prayer, and if you never have prayed this prayer, I encourage you to do that today. No one's looking around. You can pay, pray it quietly in your heart. It's not the words that are magic, but it's the intent of your heart. You say, dear Lord Jesus, I realize that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws, and I'm sorry. Help me to turn away from my sin. And I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. And Lord, give me the hope of eternal life. I pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every eye closed, and maybe here today, maybe you prayed that prayer, maybe for the first time, or maybe just to pray it again to make sure that you know you have eternal life. I encourage you just to slip your hand up. No one's looking around, but I just want to pray for you. Yes, anyone else? Yes. Yes. Anyone else? Yes. 
to be sure that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt. 1 John 5.13 says, These things are written that you may know, that you may know that you have eternal life. If you come to God on his terms, he will give you that great hope and promise of an abundant life, but also eternal life with him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these hands that have been raised today. Lord, you know their hearts. You know whether this is the first time or the 14th time. But Lord, I pray that those that raised their hands meant it, Lord, and that they would have a sense that you have forgiven them of their sins, that they're now related to you, the creator, the one who made them, that they have a connection because now the Holy Spirit has come in. And Lord, help them to know this is just the beginning. This is the, the birth of being born again. But there's many years of growth ahead, and we pray you'll help them to take the steps to grow and to be more like Jesus Christ. May we be able to give them resources to be able to do that. And we pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.